in following Jesus Christ as our Lord and Rabbi, there are times when it feels like we're walking the path right beside Him, enjoying His teaching and counsel, uh, where we sense actual friendship and we're enthusiastic about it, knowing Him better and more personally and that intimacy is growing conversation is is natural and warm and we're eager to be with him and there is a hunger that increases with each year we're drawn to his word and to prayer increasingly we see him work and joining with him is thrilling it's like we just can't get enough many of us would say I'd like it if it were that way, but there are times when following seems more like we're back in the pack, you know, so to speak, following at a distance. We're, we're distracted, we're worried, perhaps even hardened in our hearts. We're complacent about digging and praying and realize that a lot of time has passed in this lukewarm state. And more often than we care to admit, we're emotionally distant and we know it. We realize this isn't how it's designed. And so we fear if we're lukewarm, you know, then what about the words of Revelation 3, which describe people who claim Christ but live only as religious people, acknowledging him as a great teacher? Fond of his teaching but somehow not as fond of Him. If I were to ask for our spiritual temperature, I know we're all over the thermometer. And for this reason, Zechariah is timely for us as it has been in every age. We need reviving. God's church has always stood in need of coming back, of of repenting, of returning. And I'm glad you're here for this this beginning message and the second to the last book of part A. Right? Zechariah chapter 1, verses 1 through 6 says this. In the eighth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Iddo, saying, The Lord was very angry with your fathers. Therefore say to them, Thus declares the Lord of hosts, Return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Do not be like your fathers to whom the former prophets cried out. Thus says the Lord of hosts, return from your evil ways and from your evil deeds. But they did not hear or pay attention to me, declares the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? But my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, did they not overtake your fathers? So they repented and said, As the Lord of hosts purposed to deal with us for our ways and deeds, so has he dealt with us. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Generations sometimes have characteristics spiritually which are unhealthy. What might we say about this generation? To sum up this introductory message, Zechariah is making a plea for for a wholehearted response to the Lord's invitation to return to Him. All that happened in 587, 586, and 587 B.C. when God's people were brought captive into exile was entirely in accordance with prophetic foretelling. 
they were warned that this would come. If you keep on your compromised path, your idolatrous path, you're sentencing yourself to another kind of wilderness wandering. God did not change, nor did the judgment that He um, gave out contradict His mercy. It certainly did not. But on exactly the same terms as had been offered to their fathers, young and old alike are now invited through Zechariah's words to return to God. If they will do so, the, the covenant relationship will be renewed and spiritual restoration will accompany the material restoration of the temple. <clears throat> Key words here, spiritual restoration. Is that what we're in need of? Is that what we're in need of? Spiritual restoration. I say yes. For me, I say yes. We just completed Haggai and now begin to study a very different book by the prophet Zechariah whose ministry overlapped some with Haggai and then proceeded for a few years. Zechariah's first task was to support the ministry of Haggai in the month that they overlapped. Haggai's focus was on the people serving their God by rebuilding the temple to make God's name known. Zechariah's focus was on the people having a revival in their hearts so that God's name was not just known, but strongly and relationally experienced the way that it's designed. This needed to be more than just religious outward expression. Haggai's message aimed to stir the people to the physical task before them, rebuilding the temple. Zechariah's message aimed to stir the people to the spiritual role for which God chose them in covenant relationship. Zechariah was calling God's people to please catch this here. Zechariah was calling God's people to a deeply relational faith that had authenticity. Sounds like this is a book for such a time as this. Now, if we were to think in terms of broad structure of Zechariah, the main divisions in Zechariah will become clear enough. They certainly will. And after the introduction, which is today, you know, just verses 1 through 6, come three sections of material, the visions of the remainder of chapter 1 through the, through the end of chapter 6. Those are the, the visions. And then there's oracles connected with fasting, which is chapter 7 and 8. And then there's these various eschatological writings in chapters 9 through the end of the book, which contain glimpses of the Messiah and what happens to him. The last verses tell of a time when God will be known and worshipped the world over. And so I would say to, to all of us, this is going to be a very interesting journey through this part of God's Word. And I'm really excited for it. The general introduction to chapters 1 through 8 calls for repentance and confession. Zechariah chapter 1, verse 2, The Lord was very angry with your fathers. Now, there it is. A specific reference to God's anger. The writers of both the Old and the New Testaments, part A and part B, were not hesitant to attribute anger to God. God in His whole righteous and holy being becomes consumed with revulsion to the rebellion of those whom He has created for His glory. Is there reason 
for God's anger today. This anger of God must be seen through the grid of Scripture and not through the, 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 the oversensitive softness of society presently. Given the context which Haggai helped us see, some wonder if God expressing why he was angry would be helpful. How is that going to help? Some would say. And if we find this whole aspect of God being angry, if we find this off-putting like society does, you know, when doubting God, as this society does, when doubting that he should be angry, you know, why should he be angry? I mean, um, um, there, is a, there is a move, actually. There's a move even in church world to soft sell the idea of God's anger. Make sure, you, make sure if you're going to talk about that, you better balance it off with a lot of other teaching so people don't get too wigged out. <laughs> or something along those lines. People are uncomfortable with camping on this even for a moment. God's anger. Not in the age of grace. Come on. How could it be so? It can be so. Deservedly so. And yet though, there will be those who say, is this the best way to encourage a downcast people to, to spur them to action? This question comes from short-sightedness. God doesn't dismiss history or his own character, so he raises the issue. There are things we need to talk about. There are things that need to be talked about. But it's as God says here through the words of Zechariah, but know that my aim is to make this right for a solid ground for the promises to come. Um, for the people to have a legitimate push restart, if we're going to push restart and move ahead with hearts that are all in, I don't want you, I don't want you to just build a building to be happy about. And you see, that's that's just the ever-present bait and switch for the human heart. You know, look, look, God, what look what we did for you. You got to be happy now, right, God? Your anger's going to go away now, isn't it, God? And God says through Zechariah, I want you to come back to me in the fullness of your heart. That's what I want. I want us to walk together through this life. I want vital relationship, not just this vacuous religion that is so easy to practice. So, you know, I just let's just look back momentarily at the scope of God's righteous anger. In the case of the flood, all mankind was involved. But after that, what does the Bible reveal? Whenever nations thwarted God's purpose for man's salvation, which, I mean, how dare they? But whenever nations thwarted God's purpose for, man, for, for man's salvation, that kind of perversity provoked God's anger. I mean, we saw Jesus cleansing the temple. Because those who came who were not Jewish, in order to encounter Yahweh, were given a very different picture of what it was all about. In particular, Israel, who enjoyed a privileged nation status, became most often the object of God's displeasure. And why? Because she was supposed to be a channel for God's blessing. What did Israel do precisely? She settled into a me-first lifestyle of privilege. She took that calling and said, in effect, for that part of it, get somebody else. 
for this whole thing about the Gentiles and reaching them, get someone else. And in some ways, we as believers, comfortable with our salvation, maybe not in our words, but in our inaction related to lost people, are saying that. What was, what was substituted as Israel's career veered away from God's purpose, what was substituted for that was apostasy and self-seeking. This became endemic. Endemic meaning regularly occurring within an area or community. This covenant the, you know, the covenant stipulations within the, the Mosaic and the Davidic covenants would be meaningless if there, if there were no judgment. And that God, if he didn't follow through when re repeated rebellion took place. And so destruction and exile, what was this? It was the outworking of the Lord's anger. And it was more, as we'll see. And we talked about it in Haggai, you know, when, when we're not keeping the Lord's plans for us, His calling on our lives, we reap what we sow. And, and that reaping isn't pleasant. And if we sow to the flesh, we will from the flesh reap corruption. And, and what we're, you know, when we're not living the exchanged life and submitting to our Lord, what, do, what happens? We experience living as a hardship and a drag, and a thwarted life with no joy. Are you tired of that? I'm tired of that. You know, I was reading a commentary on Zechariah that was defending God's right to anger and found an observation therein pretty thought-provoking. In the Old Testament, the wrath of God is directed toward people, not, you know, to toward a people, not to sin in the abstract, if there could be such a thing. In much modern Bible preaching, which overemphasizes individualistic expressions of salvation almost exclusively, and in modern Bible preaching, which emphasizes a God that trips over himself just to be our friend, and where grace is preached to the exclusion of holiness and judgment is often found the statement, God hates the sin but loves the sinner. The prophet Zechariah laid stress on the failure of the past generation while finding reason for hope in the present and the future. This is what we'll see this is what we'll see. And so we've got to wrap our mind around some of these realities expressed by the prophetic words of God's messengers. We also need to see ourselves as the bride. Big K kingdom, not little K kingdom shrunk down to me. And we've got to see ourselves as the church. If anything might teach us that, it's the whole list of the one another's, the one another commands that are pretty tough, you know, nigh unto impossible to do in isolation from other believers. How do we even obey a lot of the New Testament if we are not integrated with each other in the family of God? So, this next year should see us all coming together with heightened commitment to regularity. You know, it's, it's interesting how in, in church world, trends can become fully affirmed because they're practiced by so many. Being committed as churchgoers is now measured if people make it twice a month. That's, that's a committed and regular churchgoer. That's the definition today.
you know, by immersion and conditioning of a culture, we might find we're perpetuating and condoning individualism that appeals to to the consumers that we often are. But like (coughs) Zechariah, for Zechariah and his message to God's people, we also need to see that there is a new era dawning in which God has plans for his people. And God has plans for his people as a group. Jesus' bride, his church. And individualism might be comfortable and preferable, but it's hardly what we're called to. Zechariah 1 verse 3, Therefore say to them, Thus declares the Lord of hosts, Return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. As verse 3 begins, we see a fresh start, hinted hinted at the words, Therefore say to them. Just in that phrase, Therefore say to them, There is hope in that. These words introduce the immediate message to Zechariah's hearers, marking the fact that a new era has dawned. The message is no longer that judgment is inevitable. You know, as it had been for Jeremiah, Jeremiah was tasked with with a much, you know, for a much different time. He spoke to God's people as they headed into defeat and exile and Though Jeremiah had pressed the invitation to return, it had been ignored. That generation had angered God. But here, now, 70 years later, after a necessary judgment of God on his own people, the invitation is now repeated. It is issued. And I want us to see this particularly. It is issued in a relationally personal form to the group. Return to me. Notice that it's not worded in religious, ritualistic, outward kind of, you know, return to my law, return to my way of life. It's return to me. This is how this is worded. To return to me your covenant God. And that return would involve returning to the word of God and the way of life, certainly. But it would be from the heart It would be from the inside out, not the outside in. And this is how it was to work. And building a temple needed to be seen in the proper light. That temple there is not proof that you're walking with God. And I look forward to Zechariah further. It'll be some of it strange, I'll grant you that. But often when we think of revival which he talks about, we think of returning to the straight and narrow. That's kind of what we think about. If we think about revival, oh, I've got, I got, I got to return to the straight and narrow or to a regimen of spiritual discipline, something like that. That's generally sometimes how we think of it instead of returning to God himself. He says it the way he desires it. Return to me. And while they approach will involve repentance, which is always appropriate in man's approach to God. The primary emphasis on is, is on establishing a personal relationship. And it's like with the prodigal son with his father, except that here it is God who takes the initiative. God issues the invitation and gives the assurance that he will do his part. I will return to you, he says. The past can be blotted out and our fellowship can be restored. This I will return to you were the reassuring words that followed the discipline of the exile experienced for 70 years. Now this new generation, some of which were alive when they were deported, could make a new start. The Lord was going to return to them despite the covenant breaking of past generations. Psalm 30, which was a psalm to be read at the dedication of the first temple. Interestingly, verses 4 and 5, sing praises to the Lord. This is Psalm 34, verse 4 and 5. Sing praises to the Lord, O you His saints, and give thanks to His holy name, for His anger is but for a moment, and His favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, 
but joy comes with the morning. Zechariah 1 verse 4, Do not be like your fathers to whom the former prophets cried out. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Return from your evil ways and from your evil deeds. But they did not hear or pay attention to me, declares the Lord. This this verse really kind of speaks for itself, but it reminds me of Hebrews. Doesn't it? I see Jean uh, nodding her head. Yeah. Um, In Hebrews, we read, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. This is Hebrews 3. On the day of testing in the wilderness where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years, therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, They always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ. If we indeed hold our original confidence firm to the end, as it is said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. And so often, how often, I guess, and I think of my own heart, and I think of the hymn that says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. But, you know, how often we revert to a place where we're not hearing, we're just ignoring And that's what we're doing. We're not paying attention. We're content with our distractions. We are enjoying our idolatry. And that's what the previous generation did. Zechariah says, not you. Could we say it in some ways like this? That's what 2023 was like, not 2024. Amen. We've got to expose ourselves to the voice of God and His Word and more so and more so during this new year. So Zechariah chapter 1, verses 5 and the first part of verse 6, your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? But my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, did they not overtake your fathers? Wow, this is a tough, this is a tough soul-searching question. And it might be the same kind of question that would be posed after the wilderness wandering, which was also a discipline upon the people due to their unbelief and disobedience. The the previous generations, what happened to them? They died. Galatians 6, verses 7 through 9. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Let, and let us not grow weary in doing good. For in due season we will reap if we do not give up. And then the last phrase of verse 6 So they repented and said, As the Lord of hosts purposed to deal with us for our ways and deeds, so has He dealt with us. Recognition finally set in. Repentance. Repentance, when it comes, is a gift of the Holy Spirit. Recognition finally set in, set in, and repentance, repentance came. Repentance is turning. Confession is agreeing. Repentance is turning, and and if you, we see there in that last verse, there the last part of verse six, an ownership is starting to develop. You see what I'm saying? It's like it's no longer a denial. Now it's our ways and deeds 
as the Lord has purposed to deal with us for our ways and deeds. Not someone else's. Our ways and deeds. Repentance is owning up to behavior outside of God's plan for His people. And where there is repentance, there is an acceptance of responsibility that rises from once brazen hearts and once stiff-necked egos. And what we're seeing here is that God sends difficulties to change our hearts. God deals with our compromise by allowing consequences of self-focused living catch up with us. God deals with our compromise by allowing consequences of self-focused living catch up with us. This discipline of the Lord is for the reason of redemption. It's for the reason to call us back as sons. Hebrews says it this way, Hebrews 12, Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that, it, that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him, for the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but He disciplines us for our good, that we may share His holiness. For the moment all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees. And make straight paths for your feet, so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. That's hope giving. And so they repented and said, As the Lord of hosts purposed to deal with us for our ways and deeds, so he has dealt with us. He dealt with us. God's role is still very much seen in the picture. He dealt with us. He had a purpose. He purposed to deal with us, and so He did. And now that's over. And we're glad. Is a recognition kind of setting in. Life pursued outside of the wise plans of our loving Creator holds nothing but emptiness. And we don't want to remain in an emotionally distant condition, do we? That feels more like an exile than exhilaration. It feels more like life famished, remaining in, in this emotional distant condition which some of us may have related to Jesus. Remaining there is life a life famished of joy rather than a feast. God is our feast. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Can we taste more of Him in 2024? We can and will. You know, sometimes what is, just to illustrate this and we'll close. Um, sometimes what is seen in marriage is something that it is not designed to be. When a husband 
and the wife, when, when the husband and the wife begin to take for granted one another. And it becomes ho-hum. When the spouse isn't pursued. You know, the conquest thinking, well, we, I pursued her when I dated her and now that we're married, we just settle in. No longer date our spouse. Um, when the excitement vanishes, that's not how it's supposed to be. If boredom sets in to the best and most invigorating and fulfilling relationship on earth, and we feel surrendered to that and sadly okay with that, um, a revival needs to happen in that marriage. A revival needs to happen. And, you know, we may be even experiencing and projecting the same lack of enthusiasm onto our relationship with Jesus. Because we see it modeled in our marriages, which are never supposed to be that way. The Apostle Paul put his finger on this so well. 2 Corinthians 11, verses 2 and 3, For I feel a divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his coming, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. So, let me um, just introduce that last question and you can be thinking about it and maybe writing something down or take it home and say, how is 2024? going to be different. My prayer is revive our hearts. That's what we're waiting for. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for Zechariah, and we are eagerly digging into it. Lord, we don't want to just build a temple, an outward edifice that can very easily be substituted for affirmation of your Holy Spirit. Lord, work in our hearts. Change us from the inside out. Lord, help give us perception to see how we've measured things from the outside in in our walk with you. Lord, may it be different for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.